What's up YouTube? Daniel Carter at Afro Herb Keeper here. Today we are scaling things down a notch and dealing with some of the smallest critters I've ever worked with on this channel. Today we are setting up not one, not two, but six different species of isopods. The planet we live on is infested with life. Creeping, crawling, slithering life. Once upon a time, everything we did revolved around the natural world. But now, there are billions of us, and we as a species have never strayed further from our roots. Even so, some of us continue to slip through the cracks. I'm not scared of any animal, no matter the number of teeth, claws, or legs. My only directive is to reconnect you with the wild, to defend the creatures that need it most, and to do my part to preserve the biodiversity of our remarkable world. My name is Daniel Carter, and you're watching Afro Herb Keeper. So on this table in front of me, before we actually get these things started, I have six different species uh, or varieties of isopod. Starting on the far left for y'all, we have our Porcelio Lavis giant orange, uh, giant orange isopods. These are very cool. Right here we have um, Armadillium species Montenegro. The common name of this guy is the clown isopod. And these are a rather lovely looking pill bug with a, uh, a red skirt as well as one line of yellow and two lines of white spots running down their backs. Very cool species. Right in the center here we have our Porcelio capensis party mix. Capensis is a very small species of isopod, almost springtail sized. And the ones in this cup are labeled party mix because it's just a variety of colors and mutations. Right here we have our Armadillium maculatum, also known as the zebra isopod. As you're seeing right now, there are no guesses as to how they got that name. And finally, on the far left here we have our Porcelio sevilla. This is a pretty standard looking isopod, it's just dark gray with a white fringe around it but it can tolerate much more arid conditions than most of the species on this table. Now, you might be asking yourself, where do I get such a wide variety of incredible isopods? Well, there are quite a few websites and retailers where you can go online and find exotic species of isopods. If you're lucky, you might find some at a reptile or invertebrate expo near you. But all of these particular isopods came from a breeder named Sean Kramer, whose Facebook I'm going to be linking in the description. Uh, full disclosure, as I mentioned in a previous video, Sean actually supplied all of these isopods to me for free in exchange for a bit of a YouTube shout out. The thing is, Sean runs a Facebook group called US Invertebrate Auctions. And if you haven't heard me talk about it already, it's a very cool Facebook group where if you live in the US, you can actually go and bid on invertebrates such as isopods, cockroaches, uh, spiders, praying mantises, just about any sort of insect or arthropod. However, if you're not in the market to go out and buy yourself a new species of isopod, uh, you're in luck because we are also working with the native species of North American isopod, Armadillium vulgari. And I actually went outside and collected these ones earlier today. It's quite rainy outside, so they're out in abundance. And what I did was I actually just went through and picked out the prettiest and most unique ones I could find. So there are some rusty orange ones in here. There are some gray ones with lots of yellow spots. There are some solid black ones. And there's a massive one that is uh, much larger than anything else that I've found so far. So, now you know what's on the table. We've got six different species of isopods, six tubs to put them in. Uh, we're going to keep them all separate because I intend to breed these and culture them to be sold. And in addition to our pods and our bins, we have uh, plenty of supplies on the table here. Almost all of the stuff up here I collected myself. I just went out to a spot I know where somebody dumps their landscaping material and I picked out a ton of this really fantastic palm bark. And what this palm bark does is it takes a really long time to break down. So you can see I've got like the soft inner bark here, some of the tougher outer portions. Right here I have some Galapagos brand Terrarium Sphagnum Moss. This is nothing too special, it's New Zealand Sphagnum Moss, and this is going to help retain the humidity in our enclosure, as well as provide a breeding ground for the isopods and for any springtails that live in there with them. Now, an imperative part of any isopod setup is leaf litter. You need lots of decomposing plant matter, especially leaves, in your enclosure to ensure that your isopods thrive and reproduce. 
where they'll be working on this palm bark for a long time. Uh, it is worth having something more numerous and easily digestible just to act as food and substrate filler. So what I have here is a whole bunch of oak leaf litter left over from another one of my projects. And what we're going to do is we're going to take all these live oak leaves and distribute them evenly across all six tubs. Also on the floor to my left is a big bag of organic potting soil, which I don't feel inclined to pick up right now because it is super heavy. The main substrate I'm using is an organic potting soil called salamander soil. It's really good at holding moisture, and it's comprised largely of coconut fiber. You can use really any organic potting mix, so long as it doesn't have any fertilizers or pesticides. Uh, obviously, you don't want anything in that soil that's going to kill off your isopods. So now that we've gone over all of our materials and our isopods, we're going to start putting together these tubs one by one. I'm going to have to clear some space for that. So let's start with this guy up here. This tub is labeled Porcelio Levis Giant Orange. So this will be for our giant orange isopods. As you can see, I've got a real fancy schmancy enclosure here. Uh, what this is, is a 19 quart weatherproof tub. It's essentially a shoebox with an airtight seal. And the whole intention behind getting a tub that properly locks is to ensure that your isopods don't escape and to help maintain the proper humidity. However, though most isopods love humidity, they can't handle stagnant air. So we've also created some custom ventilation holes for this 19 quart tub. The way I created this, there are 30 holes in each tub, 15 in the front and 15 in the back. This creates a straight pathway for air to pass through. And what I did to actually create these ventilation holes is I took a soldering iron, you can also use a drill, and I made three rows of five holes just all along the front here, and I positioned these so that our substrate can come up to here without coming in contact with the holes. Obviously, every single one of these isopods can fit through a half-inch hole like this, so what we've done on the inside of this box is to custom cut and hot glue some very fine wire mesh. Now this might not keep the smallest of babies enclosed, but it will certainly keep the adults enclosed, and it's very unlikely the babies will be heading up here in the first place. So we have our gasket tub. Now it's time to create our substrate mixture. The first step is going to be filling her with about two inches of this lovely organic potting soil. And obviously, when you're working with soil, don't be afraid to make a mess. This stuff is not meant to be kept clean. And be sure you don't pack this soil too densely. You want to make this nice and airy so that it's easy for the isopods to burrow down into. So this looks like about the right amount of soil for our first tub. So what I'm actually going to do is take a moment from the camera and fill up the rest of our tubs with about this amount of potting soil. So we have six whole tubs filled with about two inches of dirt. And now it's time for everything else. So I've got my oak leaf litter right here. This is from a native live oak species. And if you have more than I do, you should use as much as possible. But what I'm going to do is basically fill this up with about enough to just completely cover the surface of the tub. And once that surface is covered, we are going to uh, just rake our fingers through this, do a little mixing, and get those leaves distributed pretty evenly throughout our uh, soil. Burying leaves and other organic matter like this gives the isopods lots of different layers of decomposition, of moisture, lots of choices to pick from when choosing what they want to eat. This looks pretty good to me. So what we're going to do now is prepare our sphagnum moss. Now this might not be quite enough for all six tubs, but we will distribute it pretty evenly and I think we'll make it work. Again, same for the oak leaves and the sphagnum moss, the more the merrier. The more of this stuff you have on hand to use, the better. So with this, very simply, what we're going to do uh, is open it up. There are holes at the bottom, but not on the top. So we're going to open it up from the bottom. And we need to rehydrate this stuff. So, so I've got a little pitcher of water right here. We're not going to need nearly all this. And we're going to pour about two or three cups worth in here. Just enough to saturate all of that moss, get it nice and damp. A little bit more. So once we've got that done, we are going to distribute our moss in here. This stuff isn't completely soaked through. We just want it wet enough that it'll expand. And we're going to take uh, about a sixth of this bag for my purposes. But as I said, as much as you want. And we're going to spread this through our tub nice and evenly. Uh, again, as we did with the leaves, just to create a whole lot of surface area and a whole lot of biomass. 
You don't want any big pockets of dirt, pockets of leaves, pockets of moss. Uh, you want it all to be one big substrate. Everything should be mixed together as evenly as you can make it. So when you've reached a consistency you're pretty happy with, uh, you can add some more sphagnum, some more leaf litter if you want, to the surface of the tub this time. You're not going to mix this stuff in, you're just going to want to leave it sitting on the top there. So this is looking really nice so far. Here, so you all can see, this is what it looks like right now. And what we're going to do now is provide even more surface area, even more biomass. We're going to include a lot of this fantastic palm bark. Some of these fronds, we are going to want to bury in the substrate. And by doing this, we are helping the decomposition process. We're giving the isopods and the springtails lots of places to go down there and hide. We're just going to cover that back up. And we are also going to include some on the surface of the enclosure. And here we go. We have created a wonderful, lovely breeding and living space for our giant orange isopods. Now once all of our substrate has dried out somewhat and our isopods are actually in here, what I'm going to be doing to maintain this thing is misting about a fourth of the enclosure at a time. What you really want to create here is a moisture gradient. That way, the isopods, which are often very sensitive to changes in moisture, humidity, can determine for themselves where they want to be. They have plenty of space, so if they're feeling too wet, they can move to the drier part. If they're feeling too dry, they can go and rehydrate. However, I should emphasize that our isopods do need these side vents here. Even if you have air holes on the top, without ventilation coming in from the sides and flowing through the enclosure, you could create stagnant air, which isopods, being relatively sensitive, are not a big fan of. However, it seems that we have finally finished our giant orange isopod culture. I'm going to do this exact same thing for the other five tubs, and then I'll get back to you. Alright, so about 20 minutes later, we're finally done. We have all six of our isopod cultures ready to go, and all of our corresponding isopods lined up very nice and neat. And here's our final look at the completed isopod master colonies. As you can see, all of them are very much the same in principle. They're all created pretty much identically, with the only real difference being the individual pieces of palm bark used. So the first isopods we introduce are going to be the smallest. These are our Porcello Capensis party mix. To ensure that all of the isopods and any babies or springtails that could be roaming around in here make it into the final enclosure, we are quite literally just going to dump this out and mix this substrate in and incorporate everything with the existing enclosure. As you can see, as I stir this up, they make themselves known, and they are going to disappear as quickly as they can into that substrate mixture. I may not see these ones again on account of how small they are for a couple weeks until they establish a real population in there. Second on our list are Porcelio Sevilla. This is a Spanish species of isopod, and as I said, this is the one that requires a more arid environment. So these ones, as you can see, are already out and about. That's because they don't necessarily need as high a humidity as some of the more sensitive species. As before, we are quite literally just going to dump this right in the middle of our enclosure. Make sure we didn't miss any in here. And then we're good to go. We're just going to mix this up. You can see we've got plenty of isopods in here making themselves at home. They're probably going to go hide away and hopefully we'll see them very soon. Our last Porcelio species is Porcelio Levis Giant Orange. 
and these paper towels will just decompose over time. You shouldn't really have to take those out. There we are. Man, those are fantastic. Check that out. Now that they're taken care of, it's time to move on to Armadillidium Montenegro. Our clown isopods seem to be doing just fine in here. Now we have our Armadillidium maculatum, our zebra isopods. I think these ones are my second favorite after the giant orange. Into the tub they go. And every time I do this, I am, like I said, just mixing all of this substrate with the existing substrate of the enclosure. And now last, but certainly not least, we have our lovely, beautiful, native Armadillidium vulgari. These ones should be pretty easy to chuck in here. And there we go. All right, YouTube, I think we can call this a big success. It, it took much, much longer to actually solder these holes and get these ventilation screens in place than I thought it would. But that's okay. The whole process, uh, if I had done it back to back, would have taken me about uh, four hours for six tubs. Regardless, I'm very excited to get my foot in the door and get started caring for so many amazing, beautiful isopod species. If you have any questions regarding any of these little guys, any reptiles or amphibians, or you just have a question for me, uh, feel free to ask in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, don't be afraid to give it a thumbs up, I always appreciate it. And if you're not already, and you'd like to see more isopod, reptile, and amphibian related content in the future, please feel free to hit that subscribe button. If you're already subscribed and you want to be notified when I release a new upload, tap the little bell icon. As always, my name's Daniel Carter, at Afro Herb Keeper. Thank you all very much for watching, and have a good one.